Philip Deputy of Rada Joe Rayo. And of course, our two brethren from uh, different parts of uh, Canada. And uh, I think we have online from uh, Philippines right now. Warm greetings from uh, San Lorenzo, Wisconsin, 11 for 29. And from here at St. Francis Xavier Parish, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Babuhay. Our uh, council decided that we needed something that we can spark the, the interest of our brethren in relearning and defending our faith in the midst of the fear of COVID pandemic and some civil unrest that's happening around the world. This series of lectures will help us to liberate ourselves from sin, to seek wisdom from God as his intellect is the highest faculty of our soul. This will strengthen, defend, promote, and live our faith our faith in all seasons, in all corners of the world, whether you are COVID free or not. It is also timely that we should relearn our faith. According to Cruz, uh, CRUX, uh, Catholic website, they said the rising interest in seeking information about prayer in Google, which skyrocketed during the month of March 2020. Uh, this is when the COVID-19 started. It is also an opportunity for us to help share our faith and to share Christ with others who are longing to be connected to God. Maybe we have uh, a neighbor who is an unbeliever or haven't entered the church. Maybe this time we can start coming to them and offer them to join us to attend the Mass. Our celebration of Eucharist, which tells us about God's love by inviting them to the Mass with us, will be sharing the greatest story of love. We need to know the greatest story so that we can be empowered and be excited to share and embrace the fullness of faith. We just want to lighten up our mood, maybe some of you are still scared of COVID, and to make a uh, lighter moments. Because I, I know that uh, Brad Joe and Father Penner will talk very serious. Let me lighten up a little bit. A few years ago, I was approached by my co-worker and criticized my Catholic faith. He said to me, you Filipino, you Filipino Catholics, why are you praying to a necklace? And why do you pray to banana? You heard me right, he said banana. So I asked him, banana? Why do you say we're praying to banana? Then he answered, well, I saw one Filipino. Every time he entered to his car, he held a necklace that was hanging on his rear view mirror with a bunch of bananas and did a sign of the cross. <laughs> I told him, maybe the necklace is the rosary and the banana is just a car, car treasure. And we Catholics only adore God. God alone. No banana God. I know most of us here tonight have experienced being criticized, maligned, insulted, and harassed because of our Catholic faith. Maybe it is a simple or funny issues like the praying banana, or a serious controversial issues like confessing our sins to a priest, the Virgin Mary, purgatory, same-sex marriage, euthanasia, and many more. Whenever we talk about Catholic faith, we are not only talking to the Pope, the Bishop, and the priest alone. When we are talking about the Catholic, we are talking about the we, all of us here. Whenever they, grow, whenever they throw garbage to a Catholic, we all get the garbage. So it is our duty to defend our faith. Our culture 
preach the gospel now more than ever. And the Catholics are the ones who need to spread it. Catholics can let their religion remain just a personal matter. The Church has to spread this message and to the ends of the earth, or else it will not be a Catholic. Some say that we are entering an era of a third generation of illiterate Catholics. Although it might be said that we have recently been much better in offering a systematic approach to understanding the faith, especially with the production, the production of Catholic catechism. The only problem is we people, we prepare wasting our time playing games all day than reading the catechism of the Catholic faith. We prepare sitting on our couches, watching our movie series or a movie marathon, marathon on Netflix, rather than attending the lecture series like what we have now. I myself is not an expert. I am also afraid to open up a conversation that might put me in a situation where the more I explain, the more I feel like I'm digging my own grave. Do you also experience that? Our responsibility as a Catholic is to, be, is to be able to defend our faith. How do we prepare to defend? How do, how do we prepare to defend our faith? Are we preparing something? Do we study? Or are we scared? Let's find some champions who do it well. Like the priests that we have now, Father Wang and Father Stefano Pena. Father Pena, thank you for helping us tonight, for us to set the light on the last time. Thank you, and may we all experience the joy in Christ. In the same way, let the light shine before others, that they may see our good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Worthy Grand Knight Arnold Mendoza. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, are you ready to relearn and strengthen our faith? Yes. yes? Yes. Amen. So uh, I'd like to uh, call our first speaker for the night. I'd like to call Worthy State Deputy Joe Riffle, Saskatchewan State Council. Please. Shortly after 
the Civil War. He graduated three years early and began to work in the spoon making department of the brass factory to provide a few more dollars for his family. In 1866, 16 year old Michael left home to pursue God's call to the priesthood. His formation as a seminarian was rich and diverse, spanning two countries, four seminaries, and instructions by three religious orders the Vincitians, the Jesuits, and the Salticians. In June 1873, tragedy struck with the death of his father. He returned to Waterbury for the funeral, unsure whether he would, need, whether he would need to leave the seminary and return to work to support his family. But by God's grace, the Bishop of Hartford intervened. Seeing Michael's great priestly potential, he provided financial support for him to enter St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. Four years of study, Michael was ordained on December 22nd, 1877, in Baltimore's historic cathedral of the Assumption, the nation's first cathedral. And a few days later, with his mother present, Father Michael J. McGivney celebrated his first public mass at Immaculate Conception Church in Waterbury, beginning his life as a priest. Father McGivney was assigned as curate of St. Mary's Church, the first Catholic parish busy port of New Haven. There he faced challenges related to the priest shortage, parish debt, illnesses, and hostility towards Catholics. Against this backdrop, Father McGivney navigated relationships with non-Catholics gracefully while striving to prevent the culture's hostility from eroding the faith of his people. He was a man of the people. With a priestly heart, he accompanied those of all ages and walks of life in their suffering and uncertainty found practical ways to address their needs. While his first concern was always the faith of his flock, he was attuned to familiar, familial, social, financial, civic, and societal issues as well. His strong, serene demeanor spoke of both God's law and mercy, and people were naturally drawn to his reserved, yet welcoming manner. Intent on building a dynamic parish for his hardworking and largely poor flock, he staged parish plays, outings and fairs, and he revitalized a group dedicated to overcoming alcoholism within his community. He was a man of strategic vision. Father McGivney worked closely with the city's leading Catholic men, whom he gathered in the basement of St. Mary's Church to explore the idea of a Catholic return benefit society. The new order would help keep men would help men keep their faith. That would make case that one would be both a good Catholic and a good American citizen, and would financially help families who had lost the breadwinner to stay together, thereby not only enabling their temporal and well-being, but also helping them to avoid the disbanding that could erode their faith as well. He was also a visionary. Father McGivney had a keen sense of the layman's unique vocations, needs, and potential contributions, and he drew his people into the life and activities of the parish. This respect for the lady led Father McGivney to found Knights of Columbus in 1882. The young priest designed a way to strengthen the Catholic faith of men and their families while providing financial protection while they suffered the death of the breadwinner. At the time, with no means of financial support, families were often split up, threatening both the integrity of the family and depending on the destination of the various family members faith as well. Father McGivney proposed that the new group be named for Christopher Columbus, who was universally esteemed at the time as a heroic discoverer of the new world. Columbus would highlight the deep roots of Catholics in America and the long history of Catholic evangelization in this hemisphere. The name Knights appealed to the Civil War veterans in the group who saw the noble principles of knighthood in the order's protection of the faith, family, finances, and the civil religious rights of Catholics. So on March 29th, until a date celebrated annually as Founders Day, the Connecticut Legislature granted the charters establishing the Knights of Columbus as a legal corporation. The Order's original principles were unity and charity. Unity in order to gain strength, to be charitable to each other in the benevolence while we live, and bestowing financial aid to those to whom we have to mourn. Father McGivney wrote. 
principles of fraternity and patriotism were added later. Father McGibney not only lived a life devoted to the Catholic faith, he also focused all of the spiritual, mental, and physical energies on helping others persevere and grow in that faith. And he guarded whatever might diminish the practice of Catholicism. For Father McGibney's newly formed knights, protecting the faith of Catholics was the prime concern. In January of 1890, Father McGibney fell ill with tuberculosis and was stricken with severe pneumonia. The young priest lost physical strength just as his order was moving towards the vitality. And after seeking relief and remedies, he was eventually confined to a bed directory, where his concern and prayers for his people only increased. And he died on August 14th, just two days past his 38th birthday. And today, the, rem the earthly remains of Father McGivney are interred in a sarcoph sarcophagus in New Haven's St. Mary's Church. For Father McGivney, the one requirement of membership in the Knights of Columbus is that a man be a practical Catholic in union with the Holy See. Faith for Father McGivney and his Knights was not simply knowing the Catechism, important as it is, is putting into practice the great commandment of Jesus to love God with all of your heart and your neighbors as well. True to the parable of the Good Samaritan, love of neighbor does not stop at the church door. It goes out to the streets, the highways and the byways, to encounter those on the margin of society who are often immigrant Catholics in Father McGibson's day, and bring them practical charity and fraternal love. A practical Catholic has the love of home, family and church, where faith is nurtured. Yet his faith leads him into the world, even in a world spreading slowly with anti-Catholic sentiment. In the spirit of the Good Samaritan, he is called to bind up the wounds of the sick and abandoned, to provide for the temporal needs, to support the faith of the Catholics, and pass on the faith to the inquirers, and to live a life of prayer and virtue, to love of God and neighbor. For more than a century, the Knights of Columbus have followed the formula of faith put forth by Father McGivney. Today, with a model called Faith in Action, nearly two million Knights throughout the world about the order's principle of charity, unity, and fraternity with programs such as food for family, coats for kids, special Olympics, vocation support, global wheelchair foundation, habitat for humanity, consecration for the Holy Family, and days of spiritual reflection. This really is the spring as well as the Leave No Neighbor Behind program developed to support our families, parishes, and communities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is thanks to the structure of the order and the trust that Father McGivney placed in his men from the beginning. There is no limit to the good that a knight today can do for his family and his parishes, his council, and his community as he puts his faith into action. The order was formed up as a fraternal benefit society, but Father McGivney and the men he gathered saw a higher, higher calling that was expressed in the order's three main principles of charity, unity, and fraternity. Father McGivney saw them as the three-legged stool, each one dependent on the other, and each one critical to the helping of Catholic men of Connecticut to keep their faith while supporting their new personal, civic, and social needs. For charity, the greatest of all virtues is charity or love, right St. Paul. But the modern mind has distorted these words. Charity is more than giving to the needy, and love is more than romance. What these, really, what these words really mean is to will the good of the other person for his or her own sake, even if that means suffering for me. This is the charity, the love that Jesus has for us all on the cross, and we are to approach every person with this same love and charity. In unity, none of us is good alone as all of us are together. United in the Catholic faith, knights support one another in times of joy and grief, and at every moment in between. They form a network of men and their families dedicated to building their homes as domestic churches of faith and love. And they work in union with priests to support parishes in the mission of faith formation and evangelization. Fraternity. Networks of knights prevent
that provide men is something that is too often lacking in today's fragmented society. Authentic fraternal fellowship lived out in councils, parishes, on lines, and in common faith worthy projects. Father McGivney's vision for his nights has made a difference in millions of lives and brought hope and healing to countless others. More than 130 years after his death, his vision remains our mission. Presently, he is a venerable servant of God, the title bestowed to him March 15, 2008, when his heroic virtue was recognized by Pope Benedict XVI. On May 26, 2020, the spring, Pope Francis approved a decree recognizing a miracle attributed to the intercession of Father McGibbon. The miracle involved the healing of a young boy, Michael Shackle, who is now five, from a fatal syndrome. The healing of fetal high drops, a dangerous accumulation of fluids through the body of an unborn child. And this healing had no medical or scientific explanation. The cause has now entered a new and exciting phase with the beatification ceremony taking place in the Archdiocese of Hartford tomorrow morning, Saturday, 31st. 2020. And at this time, all we wait is for a second confirmed miracle through the intercession of Father McGivney. And that is all that's required for canonization of St. Philip. So at this time, we ask that all lights in their families, as well as all those devoted to Father McGivney, they are asked to pray for his intercession and their daily needs, especially in cases of serious illness, and to report any favors and healings to the gift. share with kind of preaching to the choir, but in honor of this special event, Supreme is recognizing the beatification to uh, all pra eligible pra practical Catholic men free online membership and just to speak with any member after the event. So at this time, if you want to, uh, that's, that's my uh, information session, education session on Father McGivney. I do want to thank the Council and the Grand Admiral for the State Treasurer Marty and the Council and all the guys for putting this program together at a very much needed time in, in the world, not just not just because of COVID, but many to it, it's wonderful to see uh, and encourage at the chapter meetings that men need to continue to develop their faith, not just in meetings, not just at church, but outside that we need to take the time to recognize we need to develop ourselves and develop our faith. So thank you very much and I very much look forward to hearing Father Pena. And uh, nice to see you Father Paul. Thank you and be by Jesus. Thank you, uh, Board of State Deputy Jury Fellow.